much to uh, the VAC for hosting this webinar today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with the rest of the team. Um, I had a quick look at the uh, registrants list and it looks like we've got a nice mix of people from uh, managers to cytologists to clinical images, imaging assistants to nurses and uh, clinicians. Um, so we hope today uh, we've uh, provided um, our summary of what we've done with remote roads um, in a way that somebody, everybody can take something away from it. And that's quite a, it's a quite broad, uh, dynamic audience. So rapid on-site evaluation is a real-time morphological assessment of cytology samples in the clinical setting. And this is normally performed by a biomedical scientist or a pathologist. And it's globally accepted now that rapid on-site evaluation is, um, is, a, is best practice. Um, and this has kind of grown at, at our trust in RCHT since 2011, where we implemented a, an EUS and EBUS um, rapid on-site evaluation service, so only a small cohort of, of patients when the services were first starting up. And in two, four, 2014, um, the EUS service was formally established when Dr. Doshetti uh, joined the team down at RCHT. Following on from that, we implemented uh, as part of a one-stop head and neck clinic rapid on-site evaluation. And also we will be going out towards to do ad hoc requests for palpable um, lesions for rapid on-site evaluation. Um, and then following on from that to kind of increase the coverage, uh, we set up a Monday clinic which involved um, people with thyroid nodules that needed ultrasound being sent to these clinics but also patients that would appear on our lung MDT on the Friday that had suspected neck um, nodes would also be referred to that clinic on a Monday have their sample and have all the results ready to proceed with their treatment on the following Friday so it just sped up all of these pathways. What this meant is actually because we were expanding at quite a rapid rate is that we had to train more people to make it more robust. And we have a whole team here um, with different backgrounds, some of them cytology, some of them histology, some are biomedical scientists and some are pathologists to actually cover the number of clinics. And we currently have eight, cl eight clinics a week. In 2019, uh, more guidance was coming out saying that actually rapid on-site evaluation should be provided and it's specific, ugh, specifically in head and neck uh, fine needle aspirations and that the most efficient way to do this was uh, for it to be performed by biomedical scientists. Following on from that, we had the faster diagnostic standards from NHS England that also have rows as part of their um, a component as part of their pathway which led to us in 2023 um, developing the remote row service, which we'll talk to you more about today. So in terms of remote rows or telecytology, there's different ways of doing it. There's static telecytology, which involves someone who knows what they're looking at down the microscope, taking specific static photographs effectively of um, key areas of a slide, which are then sent to normally a pathologist remotely who then makes their assessment. There's also robotic telecytology, which um, is provided over in America for frozen sections, but also for cytology samples. And this enables, usually in America, the pathologist to control the microscope from a remote location. These are quite costly and some of the equipment isn't actually available to us in the UK. And then the most common um, form of telecytology is actually live streaming. Um, and what this means is that someone is moving and operating the camera and someone else in a remote setting is seeing that movement in real time on the screen. This is currently done um, mostly in the US and it relies on a cytology personnel. So their biomedical scientist equivalent is a cytotechnologist and it relies them to go to the clinic to operate the microscope so that the pathologist um, can look at the images remotely. But for us here at the Royal Cornwall Hospital, we already send biomedical scientists out to these clinics. So there's no point in us having a remote rose telecytology option because the biomedical scientist is there providing the assessment in the clinic. So we were under pressure because currently with our model, we were only covering about 48% of patients having rapid onsite evaluation in, in head and neck. And so there was, it was um, an inequality in care. And um, again, with the guidelines, also with the, the push with the Richard report to get things out in the community diagnostic centers and with limited cytolo cytology resource, we were kind of a little bit unsure about how, how we could increase the capacity um, amongst our team. And actually, the answer came from COVID. Um, during COVID, a lot of people, um, especially in corporate side, were working from home, which meant that the IT infrastructure had to really step up and be improved. But it meant we had accessibility to things like Teams. 
what it also meant as well was that we had to social distance and we were still um, we found it really important that we still remained people uh, training people and developing people and, and obviously if you're socially distancing this can be a bit of an issue particularly when you're trying to hold multi-header sessions so what we did is we would um, use a microscope with a camera and screen share on teams um, to enable people to still train in cytology so we thought well actually if we can do that here on our floor we could do that anywhere and if we've got limited cytology resource why not use existing staff who are already in the clinic to provide a remote road service? So we looked at the clinical imaging assistants. Actually, when you look at their role, they have a lot of transfer transferable skills and key attributes that are required to actually prepare samples and operate a microscope. They follow instructions, they're safety conscious because they're dealing with patients and clinical scenarios. They're obviously calm because they're dealing with patients. Um, they have good observation skills and can communicate with both professionals and patients. Um, they are adapting continually to a clinical situation, which unlike a laboratory, which is pretty static, there's more dynamics and things can change quite rapidly in a clinical environment. And also they'll have exposure of seeing FNAs being performed, seeing biopsies being performed and other diagnostic procedures, as well as keeping records um, and troubleshooting, operating, maintaining and often moving ultrasound equipment around. So we'd identified our people, then we thought, right, OK, what equipment are we going to need? And we had funding from Peninsula Cancer Alliance for £33,000, which enabled us to get two microscopes, uh, all of the two laptops, all of the software we needed and the equipment to function with rows, so remote rows. And if you look at the camera on the right, you'll see that there's a high resolution camera on the right hand side at the back of the microscope and this actually gives me a bird's eye view of Mandy's hands, so Mandy the CIA, when she's preparing the sample. So I can see how much sample we've got in real time, how she's preparing the sample, if there's any issues with preparing the sample rather than being completely blind to what's going on with the sample prep. And also on top of the microscope is the camera for the um, cell view. And after Mandy has finished preparing the sample, we switch to uh, Teams enables you to switch camera views. So I could switch to the cell view and see the cells on the slide. In the cytology lab, it means that I need a high resolution medical grade digital screen. Um, and these were coming about anyway because of the transition to digital histopathology. Um, so we didn't actually have to purchase these screens. We had them all already available in the department. And um, we validated the screens using the leads point of use screen test assurance tool, which not only says that your um, screen is of a high enough resolution, but also um, you do it before each clinic to make sure things like sunshine, although it doesn't happen very much, are not impacting on the quality of the image that you're having on the screen. And it takes about, I don't know, 30 seconds to do this test. And, and the link is below if you're interested. So we had our equipment, we identified the people, uh, we had support from our local clinical teams and the management teams to pilot this, and then we got medical ethical clearance also. So we divided the project into four phases, phase one being local training and development, Phase two was the main site testing, which involved patients. So that was actually in a, um, a clinic that's directly below the cytology lab on the floor below. And then phase three was community site testing. So it was at, based at Red Ruth, which is about 15 miles away from the cytology lab. And then phase four, how do we make this a more robust service and a fully implemented service? So phase one um, for the CIA training, we made a fairly comprehensive um, ROSE training um, program with someone who, with the view of someone who had never had any cytology experience before. And so it was really comprehensive. It covered all of the sl um, slide preparations, the equipment, the professional conduct, um, how to triage samples, the fixatives that we use for different scenarios, um, and in particular, the communication methodologies and the type of communication that we needed to use during, um, during these um, sessions. So when we train people here at RTHT to make slide preparations, we use um, chicken livers wrapped in gloves, which make these ridiculously oversized lymph nodes that you can see here. Um, and if we have vegan colleagues, we use jackfruit. Um, and you can aspirate those samples and make slides, stain them up and see what they look like under the microscope. And it's really important for whoever's preparing samples to know what their samples look like under the microscope. If you've got a poor preparation, it makes interpretation incredibly difficult. And so this is one of the key functions of anyone for telecytology that need to be able to make optimal slide preparations. We also did weekly case slide reviews and gave Mandy some background.
background into rose, what it was all about. She attended some rose clinics um, and also looked at the microscope under some, you know, some basic cytology, morphology. So once we'd done the sample preparation, we also had to train Mandy on how to use Teams, um, how to use the Olympus software so that we could look at the cells via the microscope camera, um, how to color illuminate and set up a microscope, um, the communication training, but also how to system systematically review a slide. So the way that Mandy does it, she starts at the top of the slide, which is often the most cellular, and then she will um, go down line by line um, to make sure that she's covered and overlapped all of the slide. After um, all of her training, we looked at the competency assessment. And actually, this came later in phase two when she was actually out preparing samples and operating the microscope in the clinic. And this was signed off by a competent BMS in Rose. And we had a checklist, which you can see at the bottom, which had covers every single step from greeting the patient to preparing the samples to packaging up and labeling them and sending them to the laboratory. And she had a series of questions around the key areas of, of what we thought you know really needed in-depth knowledge now and it's quite small to see on the screen but we're quite happy to share any of these training programs or information uh, please just contact us if, if you want to see any copies of it so rather than hearing me natter on i thought we'd speak a little bit to mandy just to find out exactly what it was like so we've got a few questions for us so mandy what did you find the most challenging about this new role um, for myself the most challenging was the microscope because I'd never used a microscope before um, but with the um, training from day one with yourself Sarah and Leon um, and Gerard um, that was eliminated straight away because it was, it was just such a lovely um, program to go into uh, with your training it was brilliant um, so it was just that was my fear but it was it was eliminated so it was fine and then I just managed to progress and learn the rest of the the rest of the training Excellent. And what do you like most about this new role? Well, um, I think to me, from coming from a clinical imaging assistant where you're helping in the um, department to going on to being in, involved in the pathway of the patient for their um, diagnosis and treatment plan is just um, it's sort of empowering to think that somebody just as a clinical imaging assistant can be that involved in that kind of um, scenario. Um, and I think as a as a clinical imaging assistant, there's there's not been um, that training there for us in the in the past. So this is sort of open avenues for other clinical imaging assistants to um, be able to progress, um, which I think is, is amazing. You know um, that you don't know where it's going to lead because it's all new. And yeah, I just I think it's, it's brilliant. And I say at the end of the day, it's it's about the patient and how you are that little bit involved and seeing how, you know, especially if you see them come back and they're, you know, they're, they've gone through everything and everything has been, you know, everything's clear and it's just, it's just really, really satisfying and, and really good. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. You'll be taking the FNAs next, Mandy. Oh, well, I could do. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a chicken liver. So. <laughs> what would be your advice to anybody interested in learning how to perform this role? Um, not to be afraid because the, because the training is so complex and it's so, um, I think you can do it in your own own time. There's no pressure. It's so well um, explained as you do it, and the support from from yourself, Sarah and Gerard, has just been it's just been fantastic. And I think you haven't got to fear it. If you if you have a fear, you will get over it because the support is has just been amazing all the way through. Um, so take the opportunity. It's we don't get many opportunities as clinical images since I just think it's it's really, really good. And you know, um it's just and again, it's the it's the satisfaction you get at the end of it. That's what I think is the main, you know, the main thing. So just don't, you know, just take it if you get the chance. Definitely. Excellent. Thank you, Mandy. You do Thank a you. great job. <laughs> So alongside Mandy's training, we had to look at the cytology rose assessment, which is kind of, it's a big jump to step out from the microscope and, and switch to looking at cells on the screen, especially with having someone be your hands and operate the microscope. Um, so how we approached this is we bought 25 archive slides out from filing. And then uh, Mandy was in the room opposite operating the microscope. I was sat in here and it was basically a test. I had to see if I interpreted the slides in the correct 
way. And how what we actually tested was a form at the time, which we actually use in our clinics now, which is this form on the right hand side, which captures all of the patient information, where it was being sampled, you know, who were the operators. And then for every pass, we put our comments down in the rows um, outcomes. And, and then at the end, it's the rows opinion, but also the preparations that are required. And this accompanies the samples. Um, sorry, this is married up with the samples when they arrive in the laboratory. So it's really clear to whoever's preparing the samples what is required from the sample to get the most optimal prep. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah now, who's going to talk a little bit more about phase two. Hi there. Yeah, so um, phase two of the pilot um, was about really taking everything we had learned in phase one and applying it into the clinical setting. Um, so we did phase two at the main acute hospital site uh, with the scanning room in fairly close proximity um, to the pathology department and it helped to, to be fairly close by for dealing with any little glitches, um, internet or software issues um, that might might have come up. Um, so I vetted um, any requests that looked like they might need an FNA to this clinic, so in particular any repeat sort of U3 thigh 2 nodules, um, parotid lesions that had been picked up on cross-sectional imaging or, or anything with a high suspicion of um, pathology from the referrer that looked indicated that it would need a, an FNA. And we consented 25 patients in phase two. Um, so this required an extra five minutes um, for each patient to give them time to look through the participant information sheet um, and answer any sort of queries that they might have before um, agreeing to go ahead with the study. Um, we had Gerard, who's the biomedical scientist with us during um, phase two, um, and this was to provide sort of a bit of cushioning for Mandy, um, a bit of extra support if she needed it, but also if patients um, decided to decline going through with the study, um, then sort of Mandy had to move to one side and, and Gerard um, would, would, would do it. Next slide, please. So um, we used two teams to communicate any information to the biomedical scientist or the pathologist. And at the begin beginning of each session, um, I'd message um, the times of the appointments um, where patients might require an FNA. Um, and this enabled the scientists to be able to be organized with their time um, and, and plan their morning. And they would just sort of put a thumbs up and okay that they'd acknowledged um, that they'd re received it. Okay, next. Um, and once the scan was done, I would confirm whether the patient required an FNA um, and then send over um, the details to include the name, patient hospital number, um, at the site um, that I was FNAing from and any sort of relevant previous history. That was then thumbs up. And then I'd also, um, we learn along the way to sort of include any um, extra findings. So um, anything relevant that the imaging had shown um, and also extra information such as if the patient, patient was needle phobic or um, if they were highly anxious, it was kind of just a useful bit of extra information really for, um, for um, the BMS or pathologist to know um, who obviously wouldn't be aware because they weren't in, in the clinic. Um, next slide, please. So then we went on to uh, phase three. Um, phase three of the study involved doing the remote telecytology at a peripheral hospital site. Um, so we set this up at Redreath Hospital, um, which is about 11 miles away from um, Trelisk, which is the acute hospital site. And other than a couple of minor sort of software issues, it all went very well. Um, and then about five months ago, once uh, the new Bobman Community Diagnostic Centre had been built, uh, we, we moved the remote rover, rose service here um, to provide this service to sort of the North Cornwall community. So um, the county of Cornwall covers about 85 miles. So um, we felt it would be really beneficial for people in sort of North Cornwall who are sort of furthest away from the main um, acute hospital site to have this service up there. Um, and ideally in the future, it would be great to have um, telecytology rays available in uh, Redruth as well if uh, the opportunity arises. Next slide, please. So um, we've had some really positive feedback from patients using this service. Um, they've really appreciated being closer to home. Um, um, the peripheral hospital sites are usually a more relaxed environment. Um, and for the pilot, we gave um, patients a feedback questionnaire to complete if they wish to. Um, we had um, also, I also set up an online patient feedback questionnaire 
um, after the pilot, which gives patients opportunity to let us know um, how they felt their appointment went, how their biopsy went, if they had any bruising and all that sort of thing. Um, and also opportunity for them to just tell us any comments um, so that we could sort of look at look at our approaches and see if we needed to change anything. And we had really, really good positive uh, feedback from them as is shown in, in a few of these. Um, but we've had hundreds um, and uh, so that's obviously really rewarding for all of us as well. Um, and when, when working in the clinical setting, uh, we see how it makes such a difference to patients to be closer to home, um, to have less travel, um, uh, buses, uh, transport is not easy in Cornwall, um, really rural environment. Um, so um, it's just really useful for them to be able to sort of come to their local hospital to have um, the same same service. Next slide, please. So sort of benefits of tele telecytology, um, it now enables patients to have similar care closer to home um, with, without the need for a, for a biomedical scientist or a pathologist to be on site um, for the whole clinic session. Um, so enabling them to be able to utilize their time really well. Um, and by using teams to communicate, they can see if uh, the patient has had any relevant prior investigations um, before the list starts. Um, it's also an advantage to communicate subjects of a sensitive nature over teams rather than in front of the patient. Um, and it's a great career progression uh, for all of us. Um, we've all sort of extended our roles, expanded our skills, um, and uh, it's 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 been really fantastic to do. Um, it's a great opportunity uh, to work with different healthcare professionals, and it feels really purposeful. Um, so obviously you're saving costs. Um, it's more relaxing for the patient. And I feel like it's just a more relaxing environment for them. Um, and, and, and knowing that we have a sufficient sample before they go is, is great. Thank you. So some of the drawbacks that we found along the way with telecytology is that we had to provide longer appointment times because actually the assessment does take longer because you've lost that instinctive movement of the microscope of going to the point that you would go to without thinking about it and looking at their cells. And it's heavily reliant on these clear and concise communications and actions followed by the by Mandy. Um, we also find challenging and still challenging hemorrhagic cystic samples, samples that are degenerate, full of debris or really scanty samples. When there's lots of malignant or lots of diagnostic material, you can kind of look at a few frames and you know that actually you've got um, diagnostic sampling and sufficient sampling. Um, it's the ones where it's not um, so cellular and it takes a lot longer to um, review the slides and it can take anything up to two minutes. So it really, really varies from sort of 30 seconds to two minutes, um, depending on what the sample is like. Um, it really does rely on investment in high quality equipment. You need the state of the art cameras um, and um, you need that IT infrastructure and you need to work with your IT departments. When we first started um, in the early phases, we found that if we'd left the laptop for a week and not switched it on until the next clinic, once we switched it on, it would do its automatic updates. And then if you're trying to run Teams when it's doing automatic updates, it comes very glitchy, it drops out, you can't hear things. Um, so we stripped the computer that we use for remote rows completely back so it doesn't have anything on there apart from teams and cell sends which is our um, software for the uh, microscope camera. Uh, we also said to the IT department, warned them to put this um, laptop on a special list so it didn't go into quarantine or, or, or clash with anything on our Tuesday morning clinics. Um, and also at the start of the clinic, a first thing, one of the first things that Mandy actually does is switch the laptop on. So if there have been any updates in that week, uh, they can do it prior to us actually starting any te telecytology rows. We had to be aware, and, and Mandy and Sarah are actually really good at this, of the risk of patient um, alienation, because you're having conversations in the background that the, the patient isn't involved in. Um, whereas actually, if you're providing rapid on-site evaluation in the clinic, they're very much part of that. Uh, communication and conversation that you're having. Um, so Sarah and Mandy are very good at clearly explaining exactly what's happening in the procedure before, during and afterwards. So it doesn't look like Mandy's sitting in the corner talking to herself. <laughs> um, and it Something I feel quite strongly about is actually it relies on personnel who are already experienced in rapid on-site evaluation. It's quite challenging to jump from a microscope to a digital assessment, but without having the exposure to clinics, um, exposure to patients, what you're saying, knowing the impacts of what you're doing has um, to people directly in that room. Um, 
it it would be near impossible just to start with telecytology rows and that's just my personal opinion going through this um i think if you're going to look to do telecytology rows you really need to get some real clinical time behind you um to be able to do that well and safely so money um obviously that's the key point is that how much does all of this cost so you know once we had the equipment in place it, it, we had to cost the time um and we kind of looked at a clinic saying okay if it was a Tuesday morning not all of the patients on that list would need rapid on-site evaluation so we averaged it about four cases and actually to date that's about right um so four patients would undergo uh telecytology and we we were um, generous with the amount of cytology time. Um, we quoted 15 minutes of cytology time. But actually, when you look back over the team's calls now, you can you can see the call lengths. Um, and actually, most of them are under or within 10 minutes. Um, and the CIA time, obviously, is slightly longer because they're dealing with the patient side of things, but also, you know, bagging up the samples and making sure the labelling and the forms and everything is um, done correctly after we've you know closed off and, and left the conversation. And so we looked at the cost for a consultant BMS and a CIA at band four for a year, and it came in at just over £3,000. And for us, that didn't warrant a formal business case. And so um, the management here were actually quite supportive um, to absorb it into the existing budget because they knew that they would get cost savings further down the patient pathway with patients not having to come back for repeat procedures or having extra samples being sent to the, uh, to the cytology or histology department. And so um, we... Uh, so, but these are the costings there just to show that we, we did consider them. So Susie's going to talk to us a little bit more about phase four, which was um, making the service more robust with having additional cytology resource. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the training I did to start doing remote rows, um, I would definitely echo what Leonie said um, in that it's really important to get training and experience in standard rows first. Um, so I did that both at ENT clinics and in EUS. And I think that was really helpful because it allowed me to get comfortable with rapid assessment of the slides. And that's quite different to everyday reporting. It's much quicker, more of an assessment of adequacy rather than trying to reach a definite diagnosis. So that was a big shift in thinking for me. Uh, and doing standard rows also helped me to get more familiar with the cutoff points for adequacy and the amount of material that's needed for various molecular tests. Um, making my own slides during standard rows helped me to be aware of the technical problems that can happen uh, when you do slide prep and uh, especially with certain types of sample. Um, so, as I said, I think it's really important to be familiar with all of those things before adding the extra complexity of doing remote working. Uh, I completed a staff training record, which included discussing the indications for the procedures and uh, the various decisions that I would need to make at each point of the process. Uh, and then we did um, simulated road sessions in the department. Uh, so Leonie selected archive cases, uh, which simulated typical rose cases and showed them to me remotely. Uh, and I tried to practice making fairly rapid assessments um, to kind of replicate what would happen in the real clinics. Uh, and next I did supervised remote rows, um, initially with Leonie in the room with me and then supervising me remotely um, before moving on to practicing independently. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I then completed written uh, competency training um, to make sure I understood all the indications for what we were doing uh, and also training on how to give the correct instructions for preparation of the samples after the rose procedure. So for example, whether we're gonna make a PAP or whether we put all the material into the clot uh, to preserve tissue for molecular testing. Uh, and that obviously depends on the, your provisional diagnosis at rose. Um, we have weekly rose review educational sessions um, where all the um, standard rose cases and re remote rose cases can be reviewed um, and it's a really supportive team so you can have a bit of a debrief and reflect on the decisions that we've made and uh, learn from each other. And I also audit myself against the final cytology reports uh, to check if my decisions have been correct and to kind of reflect on my practice. Next slide please. Uh, so just a bit about the, the kind of challenges and pitfalls of moving from standard to remote rows. Um, obviously, uh, Leonie touched on this, but loss of instinctive operation of the microscope has been, for me, the main difficulty. Um, so when you use a microscope all the time, you start to use it quite intuitively 
to zoom in on the areas of interest without necessarily having a formal thought process about what you're doing. Um, so then having to verbalize how you want the microscope to be uh, operated can be quite difficult. Um, it's sometimes hard to find the right words. Um, so it's a bit like giving an opinion down a teaching arm of a microscope. Um, so one thing that's really helped is that we have the screening uh, protocol that Leonie's described, where Mandy will always start at the top of the slide and screen going up and down to the bottom. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and then we can ask her to stop and zoom in and out on important areas. So having that protocol makes it easier not to miss anything um, and allows you to concentrate more on the cells you're seeing. I think I've worked on my communication as well and the language I use to, to give directions. So I try and use more specific language now, like cells at 12 o'clock, cells in the middle, zoom in once, zoom in twice, um, and try to use the same terminology each time. <coughs> so we both know what we're talking about. And Mandy's been absolutely amazing at starting to recognize the areas of interest on the slide. So actually over time, Mandy started to um, zoom in already on the important cells without me even having to say anything or even ask. Um, so that's that's really developed over time. Um, I find it more difficult to assess how far along the slide I am uh, when I'm doing remote rows rather than when I'm physically holding the slide and I can kind of glance down at any time. And sometimes I think that's meant I've stopped screening too soon, um, but that's definitely improved over time and with experience. Um, we know that we use a lot of non-verbal cues as part of our everyday communication, uh, but that's obviously limited in the remote row setting because we're using a headset. Um, so sometimes, <coughs> sorry, so sometimes I think Mandy might be waiting for me to say zoom in or zoom out, but because I can't see her or make eye contact, uh, I don't realise that she's waiting for me to say something. So I might just be sitting happily chilling out in my office. Uh, not realizing that I'm supposed to be giving an instruction and that's also improved over time uh, and it's important for me I think to be a bit mindful that Mandy has to communicate with quite a lot of other people so she has to communicate with Sarah and the patient um, so sometimes there will be background conversations and I need to kind of hone in on when it's uh, directed at me or directed at someone else. And I think I've also got a bit better at being aware that I am talking quite loudly directly into Mandy's ear. Um, so I try to um, speak more quietly, try not to cough too loudly. Uh, and if I'm going to have another conversation, try and mute myself. And I, I hope I've got better at that over time. Uh, so one thing that's really helped with this whole process is to have the same team each time uh, so that you can be familiar with each other's way of working and communicating. Um, and overall, I found remote rows to be so much more efficient than standard rows because I can continue reporting um, while I'm waiting for the patient to have their f &A. So it's really efficient and there's almost no um, dead time whatsoever. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. Um, so our results to date, we've had 113 patients that have had um, telecytology rows and they've ranged, they've all been head and neck patients from a range of sites, so salivary glands and lymph nodes, and had a range of pathologies from lymphomas, pleomorphic adenomas, the granulomas, um, all sorts um, in the cohort. And so it's given us a really good uh, testing platform to show how reliable it is. And actually, when we say it's diagnostic or sufficient um, uh, sampling at rows, it, it's matching the final report report as you know 97% of the time. Um, we had no inappropriate requests for biopsy so we weren't exposing patients to unnecessary procedures and all of the cases for flow cytometry or microbiology and one on review were um, triaged, deemed to be triaged appropriately. Right in the middle of all of this, the CQC decided to pay a visit to the Bobman um, Diagnostic Centre, much to Sarah's and Mandy's delight, um, and they ended up observing one of our telecytology uh, clinics. Um, and at the end of the day, the feedback to the trust board, it was actually mentioned uh, as a form of best practice and that they were really impressed with what we'd implemented here. We um, also underwent UCAS um, accreditation uh, and service is now fully accredited. So we can say that we've got a robust, reliable, fully accredited and commended service that we provide here at RCHT for our patients. 
So in short, we've proved a concept that actually uh, telecytology can be performed using a clinical imaging assistant. Um, tomorrow, there are interviews for us to expand our team further by um, appointing another clinical imaging assistant to make it more robust from an imaging side. Um, we have, we're very fortunate and actually we have a collaborative working environment here, but it just makes us more of a closer team uh, and striving to make the best care possible we can for our patients down here in Cornwall. Um, and it makes it um, equalities of care. More patients can access cytopathology expertise without a detriment to resource in cytology departments. Um, and obviously overall enhances not just our lives, but patient care and experience as well. Um, we published our data in um, a Wiley journal, which is an international journal, and, and Wiley have honoured us with um, free to read access for the next three months. So if you're keen to look at our data or anything further, there's lots of information in there. So I would um, please go forth and read and enjoy. Um, and that's it from us. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, girls. Um, it was an excellent presentation. It clearly shows like what we can do as a team to achieve great results. Um, and in this current climate, especially where we all are um, lacking cytology resources. So thank you very much for that. Um, just a quick question. Um, um, can these be even utilized for, uh, I know you guys are still just one team at one clinic, but can we utilize the same system and go across between two different clinics? Uh, do, do you want me to answer this one, guys? Um, yeah, I don't see any reason why you couldn't, provided you had the personnel trained. So, for example, if it was going to be endoscopy for EBUS samples, you might look to train the endoscopy nurses uh, to um, operate the microscope and prepare the samples. Um, for us, we prefer if it's on site here to provide in face to face rapid on site evaluation because we feel it, you know, although the results of telecytology are, you know, as good as, we feel it's gold standard to actually be present in the clinic ourselves. But if you've got, uh, if you're a multi site center and you've got other clinics, you know, away from where your cytology laboratory is, I don't see why without the right training and the right resources and the right infrastructure that you couldn't implement this into other clinics. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Leonie. Um, just, um, I'll just check over the chat for any questions from the audience. Um, yeah, so there was a similar question that, uh, do you think cytology, telecytology would lend itself to the speed of an EBUS clinic? Yes, I think I think it could. Yeah, absolutely. I can't yeah. I can't see any reason why not. As long as you've like I said, you've got the in infrastructure there and the trained people. Um, yeah, why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Leonie. Um, there's uh, there's another question asking that. Uh, have you got all the head and neck patients now have the access to this uh, telecytology services? That's a good question. We, uh, as of last week, we are at um, seventy percent. So uh, we still have a way to go, but we are building our empire. <laughs> no. uh, we are looking at other options, um, particularly as you know. Sarah alluded to it earlier that we do have another site that we've actually validated for this that potentially we could offer another clinic but you know it needs to go through that management approval and you know have all the right people agreeing to that's that's what we're going to do and also that we have enough personnel to effectively um, staff it so uh, we are we're creeping up so we've gone from 48% coverage to 70% coverage and we still have a way to go but we're working on it <laughs> yeah that's great yeah Thanks, Leonie. Um, oh yeah, there's loads of uh, praises for you guys. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. uh, well done. Mm. Yeah, I don't see any other upcoming question. Um, Christian, uh, well, is there anything else which I'm missing for asking the girls? I'll just have a look, BJ, one yeah, second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you say, just some nice feedback, which is great. Um, yeah. We got away lightly without too many heavy questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this may have been covered. Apologies if it was. There's a question from Tony. Do all head and neck patients now have access to this service? Apologies if that yeah. was... Yeah, yeah, we did yeah, answer yeah, that. Yeah. We covered yeah. that one. Okay, yeah, just yeah, to make yeah. sure. No, I don't think there are any more questions. So, um, um, yeah. 
just uh, just one question. Uh, uh, sorry, guys. Um, for using this, uh, how, what was the time period did you uh, spend on just training? Uh, yeah, that's a really good yeah. question. So um, the time period for training, Mandy uh, was released for an hour once a week on a Monday, wasn't it? And from memory, I think it took about four months, didn't it, uh, in total, uh, with based on an hour a week. Um, so I guess if you could have m more protected time, because obviously Mandy's got her day job to do, <laughs> but if you could have more protected time, it would speed up that process. Uh, but at the time as well, we we ha were kind of going through the IT setups, you know, the um, uh, medical ethics and all that kind of stuff. So it all kind of ran in parallel. So it wasn't that her training delayed the rollout of um, phase one or phase two. We could actually do a lot of it um, synchronously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, there's just, uh, there are a couple more questions, sorry. Um, is it consultant BMS uh, and the pathologist only that give the evaluation? Yes, or, currently yes. at the moment, it's just myself and Susie. I feel like I'm answering all the questions. If someone wants to jump in, please. <laughs> <laughs> please. Um, but yes, it's just myself at the moment. Um, we, we're not precious about that. We would open it up to the rest of our team. Um, but um, we kind of had to get enough exposure ourselves to be able to then roll it out to other people. So um, it hope, we hope in, t in time, more people will be able to do what we can do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I see another question. Uh, do you treat the uh, lymph nodes the same as thyroid and the salivary gland? Um, in what way, the sample uh, preparation I, or yeah, side I, assessment? I, I'm not hundred percent sure for that. Even I um, will just wait for the uh, for some more uh, question on regarding that. Yeah, it's saying the sample preparation. Okay, so for our sample preparation, um, anything that's not a thyroid, we use a single sided assessment, which is a with a technique that we devised. And there, there's a paper about it. We'll give you more detail, but we basically mix the sample in the lid of a universal, and then we take a small bit um, and make a slide out of that. So that's a representation of the whole sample. So we are looking at part of each pass. Um, the benefits of that mean that we get a good understanding of what's in the sample, but we've got the rest of the material to bank for ex uh, ancillary testing, such as molecular testing or clot or cell block samples, um, or flow cytometry, um, or biochemistry, or microbiology. Um, thyroids, we put directly onto the slide. Um, it's just because they're quite hemorrhagic and you kind of want the cellularity as much as possible to be put onto the slide um, rather than preserving it for ancillary tests in, in the lab. Does that answer the question, hopefully? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Leonie. Um, there's another question from our audience asking that, uh, have you considered using the remote access microscopes in your clinic? The remote access, is there, is there, does that mean the robotically um, controlled ones? So one of my, is, was this Tim that answered the question? Asked the question? I don't know if it was, but one of my colleagues, Tim, has one of these microscopes, but it involves it being cover slipped. Um, and actually that takes time. Um, and then we also found that there was a bit of a lag. Um, the If they mean the robotically controlled um, microscopes, the system that they use that's been published and validated in America is not available in the UK um, and it's very costly. So part of our, our, our pilot was to actually do it with the resources and equipment or lower costing equipment that we have here. It's not to say that it can't be done with those other platforms, but this was just one that suited our practice the best. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I missed one question in between. Uh, um, like um, someone is asking about, would you be able to share the equipment you have used for telecytology and were your patients vetted for the clinic? Sorry, say that again. Uh, like uh, asking you to share for the uh, equipment which you have used for the telecytology. Yeah, yeah, I can share yeah. that. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. We can, um, I can, uh, what's the best way? Probably Christian will have a list of delegates. So we can, uh, I tell you what, the best thing to do would be to email the BAC uh, email address. And then if you want any resources, I'm more than happy to share that through you because that will get fed back down 
happened to me. That's probably the easiest way to share materials um, of the types of equipment and things. Um, but actually, it's in that paper as well. All the equipment that we used is, is in the published um, paper. Uh, and Sarah, do you want to talk a bit more about vetting? Because that's your remit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, can you put your speak on? Um, so vetting really there's no kind of simple solution to that you just kind of have to sift through and see what you think is going to be relevant for this clinic um you know we we vet tons and tons of head and neck um lots of them are sort of just lumps and bumps um so really um you know there's a few that you can take out a chunk of them um that you know are going to need um an fna and they will be really suitable for this clinic sort of thing like um the repeat u3 thigh twos um you know they're going to have an fna um things like parotid lesions um that you've seen on cross-sectional imaging that they they need you know um, a sample from so um they're really sort of suitable um and maybe lung cancer patients as well um you know for um fossa nodes um so really it's just kind of sifting through there's no kind of quick quick way of doing it mm -hmm. thanks sarah and often actually with the rapid on-site evaluation clinics it's the biggest challenge isn't it is actually getting the right patients on the right lists um and so what we often find is actually particularly in head and neck most of the patients there will be a mixed bag um and that's another benefit of telecytology is that we don't have to sit there in a clinic waiting for the ones that need an fna you just get called up as and when they appear and it may be one morning you don't have any at all because none of them needed um an fna mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think uh, just to, just give me a second. I'll just have a quick look over the chat thing. Yeah, it seems there's no more question popping up and there's nothing which I left asking you guys. Um, yeah. That's so we're it. done. Great. Uh, Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you very much for um, speaking on our webinar and yeah so and for the participants please feel free to contact uh, BSE for any further information regarding this webinar <laughs>